Uh, so I'm the administrator at the Division of Aquatic Resources um, under DLNR. I'm fairly new um, at this position uh, officially. I was just hired, I think, two months ago as administrator, but I've been acting in the role for about a year now. Um, and I've been with Division of Aquatic Resources for about eight and a half years now. And actually my first job with the division was working as a super sucker technician, actually vacuuming seaweed um, off of the reef. Um, so um, my job's changed a lot since then, um, but we've also seen a lot of changes uh, in the Bay and Kaneohe. And in this day and age of hearing all this gloom and doom about coral reefs and everything declining, there's actually some really positive training uh, changes that we're seeing in the Bay. Uh, and so I'm gonna share some of those with you today. Uh, so since I am the administrator of um, DAR, I have to share a little bit about the, the division um, before we get into uh, the, the main focus of the, the presentation. Um, but our mission is to manage, conserve, and restore the state's unique aquatic resources and ecosystems for pre present and future generations. Um, and so in terms of uh, what DAR is responsible for in the state, uh, we manage all the aquatic resources out to three nautical miles. So those outlines that you can see around each island, that's our jurisdiction. Uh, so that covers an area of over 3,000 square miles and over 1,400 miles of shoreline. And that's also not to mention um, the Papahonaumokuakea uh, National Marine Monument uh, that we also co-manage along with NOAA U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in OHA, that is over 582,000 square miles. Um, so uh, a pretty large area to cover. Uh, to be honest, we don't even have a boat to get us to the monument. So most of our focus is on the, the main Hawaiian islands. Uh, so talk a little bit more about um, where DAR focuses. So we also manage the aquatic resources and streams. Uh, we have more than 400 perennial streams um, throughout the state, totaling over 440,000 miles. Uh, these are the home of five different species of endemic O'opu, or the, the gobi, and then also a variety of um, native invertebrates, the opai shrimp, uh, hi'ivai snails, hapavai, and pipivai. Streams are faced with a number of threats uh, from invasive species like tilapia, uh, water availability. Uh, some of our streams are um, choked with diversions for irrigation and, and um, water needs, um, but these these diversions can also create passage barriers for fish trying to move up the streams and to be able to access uh, habitats. Estuaries are, are also a main focus uh, at the division, and so estuaries are where freshwater meets saltwater. Uh, most of the time, these are the the mouths of streams where they enter the ocean, but uh, what we're finding is uh, you don't even need a, a stream to have an estuary. Uh, through our groundwater network, uh, we're actually finding estuaries nowhere near streams. Uh, and estuaries are extremely important habitat for juvenile fish. Uh, they're actually the fish factories um, for the reef uh, and then also estuarine uh, fish species and over a hundred different species of, of fish are found in our estuaries. Uh, some of the major threats to estuaries are invasive species, um, vegetation like mangroves and California grass, but also um, the fish species like the conda mullet and, and tilapia um, pose um, major impacts, and then also coastal development. Anchiline pools are, are also a very unique and special habitat um, to Hawaii. Um, uh, we have the largest concentration of anchiline pools um, with over 500. These are the brackish water, almost like tide pools, but they're connected through um, lava tubes that can feed fresh water and salt water. Um, so they create these little pools that uh, opai shrimp um, colonize and, and other endemic species. And so they're also threatened by invasive species, sea level rise, water quality, and coastal development. And then we have our coral reefs. Uh, with over 410,000 acres of living reef, uh, more than 7,000 known species of animals and plants. Uh, by the way, uh, we have the largest concentration of corals in the United States. 
uh, and we have over 1,200 unique species on our reefs. And uh, I'm sure I don't have to convince um, this audience of the benefits of reefs considering your Hanama Bay on a Thursday night, um, but uh, there are a number of economic benefits um, that our reefs provide. Uh, they're valued at over $360 million a year, so that uh, includes tourism and in our, in our fisheries. Uh, near, near shore fisheries are valued at 10 to $16 million a year. Uh, and then they're also a major source of local food production, providing 7 million meal, meals per year. And uh, another a major benefit that's just really coming to light recently is the shoreline protection, and that's estimated at $835 million a year. I don't know if any of you saw the front page of the Star Advertiser about six weeks ago. It was on a Saturday. A recent study by USGS and the Nature Conservancy um, just estimated that reefs pr provide over $835 million uh, in flood protection per year. So uh, looking at this photo, imagine um, if this reef um, wasn't here to dissipate all of this energy before it hit the shoreline. If that reef wasn't there, uh, these roads, these houses uh, may not be there. Um, so um, reefs are able to dissipate 97% of the energy during uh, flood events and they require living reef to do that um, because a, a living reef will help maintain and build itself over time. If it's dead, it will just crumble from from wave action and storm events and will no longer be able to provide that important infrastructure. Uh, the major threats to coral reefs, uh, coral bleaching, ocean acidification, overfishing, uh, land-based source pollution, and also invasive species, which is gonna be the focus of my presentation today. Uh, so getting into the main uh, topic, today, bloom and bust invasive seaweed in Kaneohe Bay. Uh, so uh, most of you are probably familiar with Kaneohe, but it's on the windward side of Oahu, uh, just up the road. Uh, beautiful, unique um, bay that's protected by a large barrier reef and then is speckled with these island-like patch reefs. There's over 70, 70 of these little reefs throughout Hawaii, or throughout the bay. And um, they're also, um, have a large amount of coral around the whole outside of these, um, these patch reefs. So amazing place to snorkel and see fish. And then uh, in terms of invasive seaweed or invasive algae, uh, there's a number of different species that uh, are found uh, in Kaneohe Bay. Uh, the leather mudweed, um, this is all over Mauna Loa Bay, uh, just down the road. Uh, also Gorilla Ogo, one of the most common invasive seaweeds in Hawaii. Uh, prickly seaweed, uh, hookweed, but the main focus of my presentation today is uh, a group of species called Capophycus or Eukema. Uh, this uh, is grown all over uh, tropical um, regions of the world um, from Southeast Asia to Africa. And it's, uh, it's grown for the thickening agent called carrageenan or carrageenan. I'm sure you've seen this on your ingredients list in ice cream. Uh, soy milk cosmetics, uh, but it was actually, it was brought to, oh, let's see, I guess my, my uh, animations aren't pumping up. I'll use my mouse. Uh, so it was brought uh, to uh, Kaneohe Bay ba back in the 1970s um, for experimentation into looking how it grows to see if this could be a, a, a good mariculture uh, crop. And so it was introduced uh, to Coconut Island or the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Um, right here, they had uh, cage experiments on the reefs. Uh, they found that it grew really well in Kaneohe Bay um, and then proceeded to go um, to other places throughout the world to, to introduce this as a, as a crop. Um, but it was left unchecked and then managed to spread throughout the entire bay. So by the early 2000s, it was already found in, in northern Kaneohe Bay uh, and there was fears that it was going to be spreading outside of the bay to, to other reefs. Uh, so some of the main drivers of invasive algae, uh, it feeds on light and nutrients. So the more nutrients uh, in the bay and so nutrients from runoff, um, you know, can feed invasive seaweed. Uh, limited herbivory, so if you don't have a lot of things eating it, uh, that can also contribute to, to more growth. 
And then also just invasiveness. Um, it has those invasive characteristics. It grows fast. It spreads easily um, through fragmentation or, or um, reproductively. And so when you have all these things together, you kind of have the perfect storm of, uh, of a widespread invasion. So in terms of the impacts to coral reefs, um, as you can see from this photo, uh, you have Yukima just carpeting the reef. And so not only is it smothering the coral, but it's also filling all of those little nooks and crannies in the reef that, that uh, fish or invertebrates or, or native algae use. Um, so it kind of uh, is you know, um, hurting the reef in, in multiple ways. In terms of the direct impacts to corals, uh, this is a piece of Yukima growing on a, on a parietes coral head. Once that's removed, you can see the tissue is starting to die and, and the, the coral colony is actually starting to die where that, um, that seaweed uh, was growing. Here's a little bit more advanced stages of growth. And then after you can see everywhere that seaweed was growing on the coral head is now dead. Um, so, so really hard on corals. Uh, so this is a map of the distribution. This is back from 2009. All the yellow and, and orange colors is all uh, Yukima and Kapophycus distribution throughout the bay. So uh, it was looking pretty dire back in 2009. Like how would you ever manage to get rid of all of that seaweed? Uh, and so at that point, our, our management group, uh, goals were to control the spread, just keep it from getting worse. Um, and then if possible, see if we could restore the coral reefs in the bay um, to keep keep the coral from continuing to die. And so uh, UH researchers developed um, a pretty clever uh, two-phase two approach to try to manage um, these invasive species. First, by manually removing it, and that's where the super sucker, which is a, an unwater vacuum system, comes in to just kind of get the mass of the seaweed off the reef to more manageable levels, and then outplant the native sea urchin uh, to graze the remaining seaweed and then keep it from growing back and that eventually um, will lead to a restored reef. To dive into this a little more, so on the top of your screen, you can see this little barge here. This is where the, the pumps sit on this barge. The divers are under the barge, as you can see in the video. They're removing the seaweed from the reef. That goes through the pumps, back through this series of hoses, back to the mothership barge and then it's bagged, um, bagged up there. And, um, uh, you know, divers have spent about eight hours a day uh, removing the seaweed. After it's removed, uh, it's given to local farmers uh, within the watershed, and then they put it right on uh, low E taro fields, sweet potatoes as, uh, as uh, a compost or, or um, fertilizer. And then to the biocontrol agent, the sea urchin. Uh, so we have a sea urchin hatchery out on Sa Sand Island at the nu uh, Nui Nui um, Fisheries Research Center. Uh, it's still in operation today. Uh, and so uh, we grow Trinucides gratilla, uh, the collector sea urchin. And, and this turns out to be a great biocontrol agent because number one, it's a native species. So it has natural predators, um, a lower risk of, of becoming invasive itself. Uh, it has low vigility, or meaning that it just doesn't move around a lot. You can put it in a spot and it's pretty much going to stay there um, until the, the algae is gone. You can even pick them up and move them to another reef later. Uh, it will graze on multiple species of invasive um, algae. They're easy to handle. They're not sharp like some of the other species of, of urchins and um, capable of culturing large numbers. To date, um, we've grown uh, about half a million of these things that have gone out to Kaniwe uh, so far. And so the process of growing these in the hatchery, we, we go out locally, we collect urchins every month, take them back to the hatchery, spawn them, um, and then we grow them out in our facility. Uh, this day two, uh, day 23, these are the free living um, stage where they're still um, swimming around. And then by about day 30, they actually start looking more like sea urchins and that's where they'll settle and, and land uh, in the tanks uh, and then we'll grow them out three to five months. At that point, they're about the size of a quarter 
and then we'll take them out on the reef in these these little catering trays and then we just hand deliver them right on the reef onto the algae and then they start their job uh, grazing away with the, with the seaweed. Uh, we also do extensive monitoring uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of the algae removal and then also evaluate the rest of the, the ecosystem and how it's responding, looking at native algae, coral, and fish. So a little look at our results. Um, we did publish this um, just last year. Uh, and to kind of walk you through this graph, so on the x-axis we have invasive macroalgae cover, so that's the percent cover of seaweed uh, and then um, we have time on the bottom, the uh, x-axis. In black are the managed reefs. So um, these are the reefs that we super sucked and put the urchins on. The white reefs, we didn't touch those at all. We just monitored them. And so you can see over time this uh, nice decline of seaweed. And then the control reefs um, still staying up uh, with higher uh, algae than the than the uh, managed reefs. So uh, this shows that um, the technique um, is good at uh, removing the, the seaweed, but also um, keeps it from growing back. But the other thing to notice is, um, so these white dots, these are the unmanaged reefs. This is just natural reefs. These also declined. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. What is causing this natural decline of unmanaged reefs in the bay? So kind of to, to explain that visually, so this is what we used to see on the reef. And then this is what we started seeing. So the, the invasive seaweed was still out there, but rather than a, a standing crop of seaweed, it's now just embedded in, in the coral. So a drastic decline of seaweed um, that occurred without us managing it or touching it at all. Uh, we have seen algae crashes in the bay previously, um, Dictyosphyria, cavernosa. This is a native seaweed, but it did dominate uh, reefs in the bay uh, throughout the, the early 2000s and, and late 90s. Um, and this uh, was thought to have um, been a result of sewage um, outfall into the bay. And so this seaweed was really feeding off those nutrients, um, but then there was a dramatic crash uh, in the mid 2000s um, that was documented. So this is our data of uh, percent cover of seaweed on the, the y-axis over time. And so you can see back in 2013, we had 40% cover on our reefs. Now today, well back in 2018, we're at less than 5% cover. So a very dramatic uh, decline uh, that we're seeing today. Uh, this is just some algae mapping on the reef, so all the red and, and orange you see is invasive seaweed. So 2014, 2016, you can just see sparse, sparse coverage on the reef. So what caused Euchema and Kapophycus to decline in the bay? Uh, we wanted to get at this question to see if this could help management um, here in Hawaii to help sustain the decline and possibly maybe even see if it's applicable in other areas. Uh, so we generated a number of different hypotheses to to try to answer this question, uh, looking at biological in terms of herbivory, um, mainly herbivorous fish, uh, and then also a number of environmental factors, um, water temperature, uh, inputs from the bay. So um, looking at stream, stream flow into the bay as a, as a proxy for a nutrient input, um, irradiance or the amount of light um, you know, hitting the bay, and then also wind and how that might uh, affect the nutrient cycling. Uh, there is other uh, possible um, explanations for this decline. This is a paper that just um, came out recently uh, documenting grease, green sea turtles um, grazing invasive seaweed in the bay as a possible explanation for this decline. Uh, but considering there's not uh, really good population estimates of turtles in the bay um, over time, uh, we just didn't have the data to be able to incorporate um, turtles into our, into our analysis, but, um, but another possibility. So our methodology, um, we looked at our, uh, our data, um, our invasive seaweed data from 2011 to 2018, also looked at our fish transect data within the analysis, um, algae cover, uh, and then factored in uh, environmental data from PACAYUS and USGS, 
Uh, we also factored in which reefs we've actually managed um, and which have been untouched. And then we put this all into uh, a model that spit out something like this, which is extremely ugly and I'll spend as little time as possible, but uh, we'll pull out some interesting um, uh, results uh, um, to focus on. So our main hypothesis was temperature. So we had two back-to-back -back coral bleaching events that hit in 2014 and 2015. Uh, this photo at the bottom is actually one of the Patrice and Kaneohe Bay. Bay. So you can see extensive bleaching. Um, and that was right around the same time that we started noticing that the algae decline. And so uh, if you still ask you know, researchers out and at HIMB what caused the algae to crash, they'll, they'll tell you the coral bleaching event. Uh, so you know, that was our, our kind of running hypothesis. And looking through the literature, the ideal growth a uh, temperature for invasive seaweed is about 21 to 28. Growth starts to decline above 32 degrees Celsius. And so temperatures did, did get into those ranges uh, for a few days during the bleaching events. Uh, and so this was our result for, for temperature versus invasive seaweed. What we're looking for in these graphs are, are drastic slopes that would suggest a negative correlation or a positive correlation. That looks pretty flat to me. Um, so not a whole lot of strong evidence suggesting that temperature was a factor in, in the decline. And then looking again at just the percent cover of seaweed over time, and then plotting, plotting in the, the two bleaching events. So this is 2014 bleaching event, 2015 bleaching event. Just looking at this, you can see that algae cover was already declining before these bleaching events even occurred. So some other factors at, at play here before the bleaching even started uh, warranting further investigation. So our, our second hypothesis was er herbivory. Uh, maybe there's more reef fish out grazing invasive seaweed. Uh, there has been uh, some studies uh, in the bay showing a number of different species that will graze uh, these, these invasive seaweeds. Uh, so we looked at the uh, fish count data. And so this is a percent cover of invasive seaweed again on the top. And then on the bottom is herbivore biomass. So the number of herbivorous reef fish. And you can see they kind of mirror each other. Uh, and so this was our strongest result from the, from the analysis. Um, there was a, a large recruitment event of reef fish in late 2013, early 2014. And that was right about the decline the time of the decline. Uh, so this, this turned out to be our, our leading uh, result in, in the study. And we do see signs of, of this on the reef. So this is a sprig of Capophycus. You can see the little new growth shoots have all been nibbled off on this uh, main stem. And then also the main stem has also been grazed. And uh, this most likely is fish. If it was a turtle, I don't think they could surgically remove those little little uh, new growth. So um, this does look like uh, fish grazing. And then studies have found in stomach contents, you know, these particular species. So, uh, so there is, um, you know, on the ground evidence of herb herb herbivory. So these are some of the species um, that we're talking about in terms of herb herbivores, um, unicorn fish, uh, uh, surgeon fish like manini, and then the um, parrot fish or the uhu and then some other pictures of grazing scars. And then looking back at kind of what we see on the reef today, uh, still invasive seaweed in you know, the, the coral fingers here, but harder to get to for herbivores. So um, uh, they'd have to really get in inside the, the coral fingers to get to these. So uh, the signs kind of point to, to herbivory. So we also looked at some other potential factors um, like stream discharge, thinking, you know, uh, possibly there's less storm events um, washing um, nutrients into the bay through, through the stream. So decreased discharge uh, would lead to a crash in invasive seaweed as well. Um, but we are also looking at this in terms of, well, increased stream discharge could also uh, decrease um, invasive seaweed by freshwater kills. Uh, so a freshwater kill was documented in 2014 in the bay. Uh, there was a big storm event that happened at low tide. A bunch of fresh water went on the reef and it nuked 
uh, the reefs uh, within a mile of the uh, stream mouth. Um, so dead coral, dead eels, dead invertebrates. And um, so our hypothesis here is maybe it, it killed the, the algae as well. Uh, the salinity tolerance of algae is um, less than 20 parts per thousand is lethal. And the freshwater kill is documented at 15 parts per thousand. So well within the lethal levels. And then when we plot the data, uh, you do see a decline, um, it, uh, which suggests a relationship between stream discharge and percent cover. So that would support this, this hypothesis that possibly, you know, freshwater events um, have, you know, impacted the invasive seaweed. So in conclusion, uh, herbivore biomass was our primary predictor of the invasive seaweed decline in the bay. Uh, but stream discharge and temperature may have also been uh, factors. And so, you know, in an analysis like this, where you're looking at long-term trends in, in invasive seaweed, but then factoring in these discrete events like uh, a flood pulse that happens, you know, in one day or bleaching events that may have happened two weeks, twice in a year, it's, it's really hard to tease these out in the analysis. So it might have been the herbivores that started setting it on the decline, but these other events may have been the, the nail in the coffin and, and maybe it's the herbivores today that are just maintaining uh, these low levels. So uh, we're still uh, continuing to analyze the data to see um, if we can you know, look more into these factors. But in terms of management implications in the Bay, so um, really important to manage herbivores um, and having um, you know, productive herbivore fisheries in the bay could really help us in managing invasive seaweed, not only in the bay, but, um, you know, South Shore, Oahu, all, anywhere that has invasive seaweed. Um, and then today we, we continue to outplant sea urchins into the bay. Um, we no longer run this, the super sucker just because there's, there's not enough algae out there um, to remove it, but um, we're still putting urchins out where we're seeing invasive seaweed so that they're able to control what is there, but also if conditions change again, um, we're well poised to, to try to um, manage it. Uh, and actually we're looking at putting sea urchins off of Waikiki uh, sometime this winter um, and expanding our, our areas that we're treating invasive seaweed. I just wanna acknowledge all the DAR staff that have uh, contributed to this work. Um, and then all the partners, Nature Conservancy, our data sources and funding sources. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, mahalo. So what do you attribute the increase of the herbivorous fish? So uh, there was no changes in management. So I can't take credit um, for my division yeah. <laughs> for that, um, yeah. but it might've just been one of these different um, kind of um, reoccurring, you know, every 10 year event type of things where there was just a big pulse of, of reef fish, but it, it was uh, recognized throughout the state. So mm -hmm. um, our teams in, in Maui and Hawaii Island also noticed the same thing with this big uh, recruitment event. So I'm not sure what caused it, if it's just kind of these natural cycles or, <coughs> or um, if we just got lucky or, or what. <laughs> yeah. Any chance that the sea urchins are gonna become self-sustaining? We've been planning them, we're gonna have to keep doing this forever. So, so yeah, that was um, something that we were hoping we'd start seeing natural recruitment onto the reef. Um, but for some reason, uh, we haven't seen any natural recruitment occurring. Uh, our, our team thinks they found one little juvenile urchin, but that's about it at this point. There's been some water quality studies in the bay that, that may suggest that it's just not the right conditions, um, but we, we haven't really got a handle in why they're not uh, recruiting, uh, considering we've put half a million urchins out there. But then others that are wor worried about urchin barrens and you know urchins taking over the whole bay, you know, are kind of comforted in that, you know, they're not reproducing. So, so yeah, it, it's, it's another mystery. Well, along that line, are the urchins you put there any evidence that they're at least growing a little bit? They, they absolutely grow. So, yeah, when we put them out, they're, you know, smaller than a golf ball. And within three months, they're usually about the size of an orange. And, and then once they've been out there a year, about the size of a grapefruit. So they, they grow really quick. Um, but, you know, there's also eels and octopus, um, you know, out there that are, they're also helping themselves. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So obviously eating the seaweed is a good benefit to the coral, but do the urchins provide any benefit beyond that? Or is it sort of like they don't hurt the coral and eat the seaweed? So yeah, I mean, I guess they're they're prey for other, um, you know, reef fish um, and invertebrates out there. Um, yeah, we have looked in to see if, you know, the numbers we're putting out could possibly hurt the reef. Um, there were some experiments done at UH where they did some tank experiments to see if uh, they could impact coral recruitment or coral growth. And, and they stuffed tanks full of these urchins and, and saw no impact on coral recruitment. So we haven't seen any impacts in terms of benefits, I guess, just the, the natural benefits that they provide to the ecosystem. Yeah. Anyone else? So you mentioned spawning the um, urchins. Is that, uh, like, what is that process? Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's kind of easy. Uh, they're kind of their natural stress response is to spawn. So um, we'll dive down. We usually dive around like the airport and collect about 30 urchins a month. And they'll already start spawning as you're, you're on the dive. Uh, but then we'll take them back to the, the hatchery. Uh, the females, um, we'll just shake them a little bit. We put them upside down in poke containers um, with a little hole cut in the lid. Turn those upside down. Let's see move back to this, uh, you can see the photo. So turn them upside down on a poke container and you can see the female um, releasing its eggs. And then the males will just use like a little pipette to um, extract the sperm. And then we just mix them in the, the hatchery. And then um, there's a whole process of growing microalgae to feed the larval stages and then growing macroalgae to feed the, um, once they've settled. And so it, it's a it's a huge operation, um, but I, I don't begin to understand all of the little steps are, we have an amazing hatchery manager named Dave Cohen that um, basically was the first one in the United States that was able to figure out how to do this. Um, they've been uh, growing urchins in like Okinawa and um, Australia for a while, but no one had done it in the US. So he he had to develop a lot of his own techniques and um, he just has a lot of aquaculture magic that he's able to just um, keep producing these things. Okay, you are know, herbivorous, you know, you know, algae eating fish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but was it sustainable? After, you, after the algae got eaten, what happened to the plant? So um, the biomass of the fish or the fish, the fish. let's see, uh, I think I have a graph that shows fish biomass. Uh, yeah, so this is fish biomass. And so that, that big recruitment event um, was late 2013, 2014. So I think this is just kind of following that cohort. And the reason why it's going up is not necessarily because there's uh, more fish, but they're getting bigger. And so the biomass is growing up. So that that cohort seems to have um, continued to increase a, as they've got bigger. Um, so it seems to be sustained. Uh, this is this ends at 2016. We've got to update um, the, the graph. Um, but from what I've heard, it, it seems like um, numbers are still looking pretty good. Because the amount of cover increased so dramatically. So yeah, that, that's a good point. Less food, what, what are they eating now? Um, so, so yeah, um, apparently they're finding um, stuff to eat, um, but yeah, that's a good question. And yeah, the urchins still manage to find stuff to eat too. Yeah. So those, I forget what the name you used for them, but those interesting ring formations in Kaniokia Bay, what causes those? The um, patch reefs. Yeah, the patch reefs, that's um, not sure. Do you you happen to know how to answer that? Actually, it's um, I think to my understanding, that. Um, it hasn't been investigated, uh, but there's interest in looking to see how those form. Yeah, that's to my understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 